There we go. I'm going to have to take you all the way back to the beginning. I practice and then I get things not quite where I want it to be. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you and uh, welcome to our worship. We will do this online worship today and then uh, next Sunday. And our hopes are to return to in-person worship on the uh, 13th and the 20th and then be able to worship for Christmas Eve. That is our plan at this time. So uh, this Sunday then is the new church year. It's uh, the first Sunday in Advent. Move my picture out of the way a little bit. <clears throat> and the first Sunday of Advent, we begin now these four weeks of preparing for the coming of Christ as a Christ child and as the coming of his, uh, his coming in, in all of his power and glory and his second coming. Just to acknowledge the copyrights for the Bible readings and some of the liturgy that I'm using, that is all uh, from Augsburg Fortress, and uh, then the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. We have that copyright as well. The couple of announcements. Uh, Wednesday will be confirmation. We'll return to confirmation, and I ask the kids to check in at 645, and class will be at 7 o'clock. I'm getting your papers ready to mail out. I hope you get them in time. Otherwise, I'll, I'll email them. Next Sunday will be Zoom. And uh, as I explained earlier, then our hope is to return to in-person worship on December 13th and 20th and for Christmas Eve. I'll have Advent worship this evening. We normally have Sunday evening Advent services, and I will do that at seven o'clock. And I plan to do that for the season of Advent. We'll just do it from this point of view. The same address as this morning, providing I manage to get the right one. Our first candle is the candle of hope. So we worship in the name of the triune God, Father, the King of Peace, the Son who comes as the Prince of Peace, and the Spirit who grants us peace. We would be lighting our Advent candle, and the Advent candle shines with hope and faith to fuel its timeless flame. Like the old prophets, we declare Emmanuel, our Savior's name. Our service then for this evening will be focusing on hope. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess our sins, remembering our baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess. Eternal Father, we confess that we who walk in your light have yet to shake off the darkness. We linger in the shadows of sin that which you command, we have failed to do. That which you forbid, we have done, <clears throat> rebelliously or with an attitude of indifference. In the radiant light of your holy will, we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Forgive us, Lord. By your spirit, clothe us with the perfection of Jesus Christ and train us for righteousness. For the sake of the life, passion, death, and rising of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And hear the good news, that as ever, Christ comes with forgiveness. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You have been brought into the light of God's grace and dressed in righteousness. Christ is coming soon, so walk as becomes people of the light. Come, Lord Jesus. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> I'm reading from two lessons today from Isaiah, which is lamenting, looking for uh, God's coming, 
and then we'll read the gospel reading from Mark. From Isaiah 64, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. Make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds, that which we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you, are, you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, <clears throat> and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of your iniquity, of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The gospel reading for today is from Mark chapter 13, beginning with 24, verse 24. <clears throat> Jesus said, in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the earth. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, to all, keep awake. This, today I'm looking at the urgency of Advent. <clears throat> Well, grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are living in a time of urgency. Sitting in line at your favorite fast food restaurant really messes with our sense of urgency. How come that person up ahead is ordering 12 happy meals and turning to each of the children in the back of the car or the van and asking, what would you like? And the kids have to wait and decide, or at least that's what my imagination thinks when I'm waiting. The sense of urgency builds up inside, not because of hunger, but because we are tired of waiting. I like to listen to lectures on my phones. I download uh, lectures of various professors from seminary. And so I've learned to download those things and I listen to them while I'm waiting. And that helps me pass the time, it gives me something to do and the urgency is not quite so serious. 
There's a sense of urgency as we await for a vaccine for COVID. Our anticipation is that this vaccine will be the light in our darkness. It will alleviate our fears and allow us to go back to what we consider to be normal. But we come back to what we do while we are waiting. Entering into the season of Advent, we enter into a time of urgency. As we plan our celebrations, remembering the birth of Christ, that is Emmanuel, God with us. But this year, our urgency has taken on a different tone. How will we celebrate the birth of Christ when we cannot have our get-togethers? And I've been thinking about it. This is the first time in my memory, all the way back to when I was a child, that we have not been able to have our Christmas programs. How will we shop for Christmas? Some of the younger people are used to using uh, online shopping, but for some of us people my age, I want to touch things and hold it up and look at it and think about it and see will they like this or not. And then I sit and wonder, well, I can get these things, I can mail it, but what will it, how will I be able to watch them open the gifts and see their surprise and their joy and, and simply everything about being together. And the urgency of this Christmas season, this Advent season, is when will our families be able to get together or will they even be able to get together? So there's an urgency as we struggle with questions and disappointments. Entering into this season of Advent, we are also turning our eyes in another direction besides the celebration of the birth of Christ. It is our time of looking toward the second coming of Christ. There tends to be an urgency as we wait for the second coming of Christ. There's this urgency that realizes that the struggles of sin, of death, and the devil, that will all be gone. We will no longer have to wrestle with tears and grief and illness and all the other things that just beat us down. So we look forward to the second coming of Christ. What a glorious and wonderful day that will be as we're set free and also as those who are in their graves will be raised from the dead. But this is just one more urgent waiting for us. How will we know when the time is coming? Well, Mark in chapter 13 writes, in those days, right after that time of suffering, the sun will become dark and the moon will no longer shine. The stars will fall and the sky will be shaken. How will we know? How will we know that the time is near? At our favorite fast food place, you can tell I like to think about food, the signs are clear. The cars ahead are moving. Maybe slowly, but they're moving. The other day, it was finally my turn to order. And I heard this faint, welcome to McDonald's. How can I take your order? And I gave them my order. And I speaking as clearly and loudly as I could. So it's, there's no question. And we don't have to take, waste time trying to figure out what I'm trying to order. There was no response. The person had said, welcome to McDonald's. Can I take your order? And I gave them my order and there was no response. My sense of urgency was quick, quickly turning into becoming rather perturbed with the situation. And then I realized I was listening to and responding to the speaker in the other lane. How will we know? when we're listening to the right voice? How will we know when Jesus returns and we're not looking at something on the other lane? The Gospel of Martin gives signs that we tend to focus on. We tend to look around and see all the troubles of the world and think, well, the time must be cl getting closer. Well, the Gospel of Mark also goes on to say, as for when the time will be, and Jesus uses the example of the fig tree. People can tell when spring and summer is coming as we watch the fig tree, or for us, as we watch any trees. We watch and we see that there are buds. When we see the buds, we know that spring and summer are near. And those buds are a promise of a sign of new life. 
Some people spend time looking at the signs and being filled with anxiety and, and that sense of urgency and fear, but there are other signs to look at. Jesus says, look at those buds on the tree. We know that spring is coming, but we cannot mark the time on a calendar. We cannot mark the date or time of day. They would just be there one day when the time is right. And there's nothing that we can do to speed it along. We need to note in verse 32 of chapter Mark, uh, Mark uh, in verse 13, in chapter 13 of Mark, verse 32. And I encourage people maybe to underline the, this verse. When Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour or the day of the time, the angels in heaven don't know and the son himself doesn't know. Only the father knows. The signs are not for us to figure out. That's all God's plans. We do not know, nor can we know what the living God knows. Our minds are limited in time when compared to all of eternity. Our interpretations of the second coming of Jesus are often limited to our sinful desires. So we must keep in mind that the second coming of Jesus, just like the first coming, is a knowledge that belongs only to the Father in heaven. His coming as a child or his second coming in all of his power and glory is not dependent upon the calendar. It is not dependent upon our trying to fulfill various prophecies so that when everything is right, then Jesus will return. There is no room for us to play God. The second coming of Jesus is in the Father's hands. So what do we do while waiting? Jesus says, keep awake. Do what Jesus has taught us. Back in my days of working for the Oconomowoc Canning Company in uh, Cobb, Wisconsin, we, we canned peas and corn. And my job there was to hire and fire people. It's a job I would not encourage anyone to take, but it was a summer job and it was morning, uh, uh, summer, and uh, excuse me, I was in school and it was a summer job and it was money and that was it. I, I did what I had to do. Well, one night I got a new person in and the foreman told me to take that person back and show her how to run this certain machine. I knew where the machine was. I had seen it operate, but I really had no idea how to run it. Someone who knew how to run that machine had to train this new person. Well, now think of Jesus' illustration of a man going on a journey. And even though the Bible does not speak of this directly necessarily, he leaves his slaves, his servants in charge. They would have to be people who have worked for him for some time, whom he has taught and showed what to do. He's trained them. You don't just get a new person and say, here, go do this. He's not blindly leaving these, these slaves or servants. He has taught them, showed them how to do things, and now he trusts them enough to leave and come back when he thinks it's right to come back. Well, Jesus Christ came into this world the first time, and he showed us how to be faithful. He cared for those who no one else cared for. He hung out with sinners, everyone from prostitutes to tax collectors. He reached out to those with that awful disease of leprosy. He forgave a woman who committed adultery. He set the example for us. He taught us what to do after he returned to heaven and what we should be doing until he returns. Jesus did not just blindly leave us to do things. He showed us how. And his followers throughout the centuries since he ascended into heaven, his followers, that is the church, have been passing this knowledge down from one generation to another. So keep awake. Jesus has taught us what to do. The second task that we are given is to recognize the gifts that God has given us to do the work in the kingdom while we await his coming. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, 
you th just think. You don't need a thing. You've got it all. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our master or Lord Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. And not only that, but God himself is right alongside to keep you steady on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God, who st got you started in this spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of his son and our master Jesus. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. So just think. Keep awake. And don't worry. Go on about the work of God's, uh, of God's kingdom, but use the gifts that God has given to you. He's given us all that we need. And again, Jesus did not ascend into heaven to leave us just, well, what do I do? How do I handle life? What, how should I care for people? How do I live in the kingdom? How do I share it? And so on and so forth. But rather, he gave us all that we need. And so our task, while we stay awake and wait, is to use the gifts that God has given to us. And finally, a third part of keeping awake, a third task. It comes from Isaiah. Then, it, it, And that part of waiting is repentance. And repentance, remember, means to turn around, to do things differently. A question I often think about is, uh, when we talk about repentance, is how many Christians skip church at least once during September or December to go shopping, and then they complain that Christ has been taken out of Christmas? Are we repenting of our sins and turning our hearts and our lives, our entire lives, toward Christ? What are we willing to do to repent, to change our ways, to prepare our souls and the souls of our families for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We are in a time of waiting, but we are in a time of hope. Advent is about hope. We are in a time of urgency. We are in a time of waiting while working at staying awake and going about the work that God has given to us. And our Advent season it's not empty, useless waiting. Remember looking at the buds on the tree that tell us that spring is near. Advent is a season of promise, as we hope. Advent is a time of waiting, a time of urgency. It is a time of waiting with hope based on the promises of God. And we must remember them as we look towards Christmas and as we look towards the second coming of Christ that God keeps his promises, that we can depend on. Even as the world is changing around us, even with all the dark days around us and the struggles we're experiencing right now, while we wait, we must remember and cling to the gift from God that God keeps his promises. Please join me tonight for the Advent evening service and I'll talk about that some more and the idea of hope in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which is beyond all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. With the turning of the church's year, we begin our pilgrimage towards Christmas and the child who on the cross became our king as we await his return. In his name, let us pray. Lord Jesus, cause us and those who lead us to do what is just and right. Renew us, make our love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone. Strengthen our hearts, Holy Spirit, and make our faith sufficient for what lies ahead, so that we will be blameless and holy in your presence when Christ returns. Lift up our heads to see what you are doing. Make us ready. Deal graciously with those who are in sorrow. And this day we think of the family of Gary Haynes at the death of his mother and ask that you will comfort them, 
and that the promises of God, especially the promise of the resurrection to eternal life, will bring them comfort and peace. Deal graciously with those who are sick. Tom Larson and Mary Franzen, Carol Tiki and Pam Schmidt, Marilyn Hesch, Bob Madsen, our folks in the nursing homes and all those who are working in the nursing homes. And for those who work with sickness in the hospitals, the doctors, nurses, nurses aides, even the janitors, take care of them and deal with them graciously and grant them your strength. Pour out your spirit upon all branches of Christendom. Guide us and strengthen us as we wait. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us join together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with all of his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go forth in peace to wait for the Lord and to serve him. Amen. <laughs>